Good morning. Thank you all for coming at uh, short notice uh, for this uh, most important uh, announcement and speech uh, by Secretary of State for Health. It's a particular pleasure to welcome him back here for the uh, first physical event that we've uh, held since uh, the uh, pandemic uh, hit us all. He was, of course, the first uh, government minister to deliver a speech uh, after the general election uh, in, of any minister when he came here to outline his vision uh, for the future of uh, UK healthcare last December, December 18th. And we're delighted now to welcome him back, obviously, in these very different uh, circumstances, a particular uh, pleasure to do so today. Um, there are the usual house rules, of course, he's very kindly agreed to answer questions. No question too outrageous. You simply have to state your name and organization first. But the other aspect, of course, uh, with the much smaller audience that uh, we have today is everyone, obviously, unless they're speaking, uh, keeps uh, uh, requested kindly to keep their masks uh, on. We do also uh, have a, a microphone which will be put up. So when the questions come, if you can keep your mask on till you get uh, to the microphone uh, and then um, if you can uh, put it back on once you've uh, finished uh, the question. And so it's always a particular pleasure to welcome Matt here because of the uh, breadth uh, of his vision. It was particularly significant last time because, of course, it was for the relaunch of our health unit uh, under Richard uh, Sloggett, former special advisor at the Department of Health. And now we're delighted also uh, being augmented by the arrival of uh, Robert Ead from the private sector from consultancy. And we look forward to a very uh, extensive uh, program of work one item, key item which was launched recently, which is what do we want the 21st century hospital to look like in the light of the pledge to build 40 new hospitals, which has had many outstanding responses, and we'll be keeping you informed uh, of that as well. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Matt, for coming here, and uh, particular thanks to our team, Julia Mizzen and others, for organizing uh, this event at such short notice and with uh, an audience that we know is to match the importance and uh, quality of the event and the importance of the occasion. Thank you, Matt. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Dean, and it's a real uh, pleasure to, to be here. One of America's most renowned surgeons general, Everett Koop, once said, healthcare is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to all of us all of the time. And if the last six months have taught us anything, surely they have taught us that. No one is untouched. Public health is not narrow. Public health comes from everything. The air we breathe, the food we eat, how we protect ourselves, and our communities from the threats from afar. The coronavirus pandemic has shone a light on our public health system, just as it has on so much of modern life. And we've learned a lot about the virus, about what's worked, about what needs to change, and about what we need in order to be the be in the best possible position to fight COVID-19, to fight all infectious diseases, and to prevent ill health now and long into the future. Our nation's public health experts have delivered incredible work during this pandemic just as they did in the response to Ebola and Novichok and countless small outbreaks of diseases like norovirus and meningitis that no one ever hears about because our public health teams quietly and efficiently do their job day in, day out. Now, over the past few months, we have seen some extraordinarily talented people working so hard to tackle coronavirus. It was our public health scientists who sequenced the genome of COVID-19 at Portland Down and Collindale, who created a diagnostic test for coronavirus at blistering speed, and who worked working alongside local directors of public health, who've given us the boots on the ground to investigate and quash outbreaks at a local level. And the research, especially from Public Health England, has been some of the best that's been done into this novel disease which of course we knew nothing about just a few short months ago. And I want to say this very directly 
to all of my colleagues in public health. Colleagues at Public Health England, local directors of public health and their teams, contact tracers, diagnostics experts, epidemiologists, infection control teams, and every single person who's contributed to this national effort. You have been working around the clock since January. You have done exceptional work, and I am so proud of the part that you have played in tackling this pandemic. And with winter ahead, the life-saving work that you're doing is more important than ever. The changes that I'm announcing today are designed entirely to strengthen our response, to ensure that the system works to help you do your vital work. We're making the change now because we must do everything we can to fulfill our responsibilities to the public, to strengthen public health in the UK. Now, I take my responsibilities incredibly seriously to get this right. As Secretary of State, it is me who is accountable to Parliament for how the system operates. And I want to make sure that we have the best possible system, having learned everything we've learned during this crisis so far. The world has not seen a pandemic on this scale in modern times. And while we have some of the best public science, public health science in the world, including, of course, the world's leading vaccine candidate and the world's only scientifically proven treatment for COVID-19, we did not go into this crisis with the capacity for a response to a once in a century scale event. For example, even though we have some of the best labs in the world, we couldn't call upon a large private sector diagnostics industry that some other countries were able to do. And as a result, we've had to respond at an unprecedented rate to build our testing capacity at scale, to build a contact tracing system on a size never envisaged before, to boost our analytical capability through the Joint Biosecurity Center, and alongside, of course, building the NHS capacity we needed, including through the Nightingale hospitals, again, at a pace never seen before here, to make sure that the NHS was never overwhelmed. And so to give ourselves the best chance of beating this virus and of spotting and tackling other external health threats now and in the future, we need to bring together the science and the scale into one coherent whole. So today I'm announcing that we're forming a new organization, the National Institute for Health Protection. The National Institute for Health Protection will have a single and relentless mission, protecting people from external threats to this country's health. External threats like biological weapons, pandemics, and of course, infectious diseases of all kinds. It will combine our world-class talent and science infrastructure with the growing response capability of NHS Test and Trace and the sophisticated analytical capability that we're building in the Joint Biosecurity Center. Of course, these institutions work incredibly closely already to get today, but I want that integration to be seamless. Crucially, this will be a national institute that works very much locally, working with local directors of public health and their teams who are, in my opinion, the unsung heroes of health protection. Their local insight and intelligence is a mission critical part of our response. The National Institute for Health Protection will also work closely with the devolved administrations, taking on existing UK-wide responsibilities and supporting all four chief medical officers with access to the best scientific and analytical advice. By bringing these parts of the system together, we can get more than the sum of the parts. And the mission, that mission is for a purpose. So we have a stronger, more joined up response to protect people and the communities in which they live. 
The NIHP will report directly to ministers and support the clinical leadership of the chief medical officers. It will be dedicated, dedicated to the investigation and prevention of infectious diseases and external health threats. That will be its mission. And it is conceived amid crisis, but it will help maintain vigilance for years to come. PHE, of course, has other incredibly important responsibilities centered around health improvement. And these are absolutely vital too. As the Prime Minister abundantly made clear with the launch of our obesity strategy last month, we are passionately committed to health improvement and to the prevention agenda. And of course, the two are linked, protection and prevention. We've seen how conditions like obesity can increase the risk for those who have coronavirus. And leveling up health inequalities and preventing ill health is a vital and a broad agenda. It's got to be embedded right across government, right across the NHS, in primary care and pharmacies, and in the work of every single local authority. So we'll use this moment to consult widely on how we embed health improvement more deeply across the board. And I'll be saying more on this over the coming weeks. And this will in turn allow the National Institute for Health Protection to focus, focus, focus on the science and the scale needed for pandemic response, that mission. And we've been looking at best practice from all around the world. We want to build an institution that constantly thrives for the best. And today, as I launch the new National Institute for Health Protection, I want to say three things that I believe are critical for this new institution to succeed. About response, resilience, and about culture too. First, the immediate task of the NIHP is to pull together in one place the operational capabilities for the COVID response. While we hold out the bright hope for the success of the brilliant scientists who are working day and night on a vaccine, no vaccine is guaranteed to succeed. So each day we must strengthen our response, drive up testing capacity, bring on new technologies, contact trace thousands to protect them and their communities and analyze and understand this virus more and more and more. So we have no time to lose. To my brilliant colleagues at PHE, I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for your service that you have provided and will continue to provide. In particular, I want to thank Duncan Selby, who's led PHE with distinction for the last seven years and his senior management team. I'm delighted that Duncan will support PHE and the NIHP throughout this transition and continue his sterling work on behalf of the UK overseas. And I want to welcome Michael Brody, who has a wealth of experience and brilliant track record of delivery, who will step up as the interim chief executive during the transition. From today, PHE, the JBC and NHS Test and Trace will operate under single leadership, reporting to Baroness Dido Harding, who will establish the NIHP and undertake the global search for its future leadership. And I've no doubt that under Baroness Harding, we will found the NIHP as a thriving mission-driven organization. We have a common mission, the greatest mission of any of our working lives and we have no time to lose in building the institution of the future. Next, while of course we must focus on the immediate response, so too must we improve resilience and preparedness, not just for coronavirus, but for the next threat that lies around the corner. We're living in an increasingly interconnected world. The UN projects that by 2050, over two thirds of the global population will live in increasingly large, dense urban centers. External threats to public health can emerge and spread quickly and can reach our shores within days. My single biggest fear is a novel flu or another major health alert hitting us right now in the middle of this battle against coronavirus. Even once this crisis has passed 
and it will pass, we need a disease control infrastructure that gives us the permanent standing capacity to respond as a nation and the ability to scale up at pace. And one of the lessons, I believe, from the crisis is that we need an institution whose only job is to look out with constant vigilance to prepare for and respond to external threats like pandemics. So as well as bringing together our core pandemic response capabilities in one place, the NIHP will bring focus. It's worth dwelling on this point for a moment. The question of how to protect a country from risks that are infrequent yet devastating is not restricted to infection control. Think of how we work to prevent terrorism and protect financial stability, for instance. Just as with pandemic preparedness, there can be years between major threats materializing, especially when things go well. And the public policy challenge is how to build a system that is resilient and stays alert for years on end, learning, preparing, ready. We can learn from abroad, from countries like South Korea and from Germany's Robert Koch Institute, where their health protection agencies had a huge primary focus on pandemic response. We will build the same focus here. So we'll ensure that the NIHP has the strongest possible function for intelligence, data analytics, and surveillance, and a standing capacity to act fast at scale so we can remain equal to any future threats. The third thing that I want to say is something about working culture. The National Institute for Health Protection will succeed by building an institution with the most revered expertise in a culture that is open and outward looking, non-hierarchical, and embraces the potential of its whole team. Getting this culture of rigor and speed, of expertise and inquisitiveness, of outward looking confidence is critical to success. Over centuries, our country has contributed so much to global public health and the life chances that it brings with the home of Edward Jenner, who arguably saved more lives than anyone else in human history with his pioneering vaccine for smallpox. And John Snow, who just a few miles from here used data in effectively one of the world's first contact tracing exercising, using epidemiological methods to help the world understand how infectious diseases like cholera really spread. In fact, John Snow's insight that published highly specific local data helps people tackle a contagious disease is as vital today as it was in 1854. We have incredible expertise in this country. We need to support that expertise to flourish in a way that meets the fast moving demands of public health in the 21st century. The creation of any new organization provides a real opportunity to build and cement its culture. And this new institute will focus on what works, bringing in ideas and expertise from wherever it can be found. And it will support a culture of collaboration and change, shunning silos and unnecessary bureaucracy. It will work seamlessly to harness the capabilities of academia and the groundbreaking and innovative work of private companies with whom we must work so closely to get the best results. It'll work hand in glove with the NHS. It'll use the most modern cutting edge digital and data analytics tools at its core. These are the qualities that will allow us to deal not just with today's threats, but with tomorrow's threats too. The first responsibility of any government is to protect its citizens. And the threats to public health are amongst the most important of all. Because it's only if people feel safe and secure in the environment that they live in, that they have the confidence to start a business, play an active part in their community, enjoy all the incredible experiences that life has to offer. Threats like this coronavirus pandemic can emerge anywhere and at any time. So we must be ready, ready to beat this virus and to protect all of us all of the time over the years to come. Thank you very much indeed.
Thursday, the Secretary of State very kindly agreed to answer questions. So if I just uh, see who the first taker is from the floor, anyone? Must be. Gentlemen there, if you can go to the uh, microphone and just uh, take your mask off, name an organization. Just, uh, Thank you, uh, Dean Robert Kogar, um, Executive Chairman of Renaissance Care. Um, very interesting to hear what you have to say, um, Matt, and thank you for all of your hard work and energy in, in leading the fight against coronavirus. It is very much appreciated. Um, my question really is on specific care home question, um, and it's a current one, but it, it, uh, I would be interested in your opinion on it is that why are CQC inspectors and other healthcare related professionals being allowed to enter care homes on a frequent basis without COVID-19 tests? Yes, with full PPE, but um, we have agency staff restrictions, we have visitor restrictions as we, we should have in the care home sector, but surely this um, happening um, places the very vulnerable care home residents at serious risk. And I just wanted to ask your uh, opinion on that and also um, on, on the care home, uh, generally the care home, how that fits with your uh, plans announced this morning. Thank you. Uh, um, do you mind if I yeah, stand up to ask you uh, questions? Well, uh, this, is a, this is an incredibly important point. It, and in a way, the specificity of the point uh, demonstrates the need for an organization that Bands, uh, the public health advice, which PHE uh, do brilliantly, and they have written the most incredible amount of high-quality public health advice spanning all parts of life um, uh, over the last uh, uh, several months, uh, including for care homes, um, and the testing capability of NHS Test and Trace. And being able to bring those things together to allow for the public health advice of how best to protect care homes to take into account the testing capabilities. Of course they can do that now, working by talking separately to NHS Test and Trace as a different institution, but far better if they're pulled together. Uh, on the specific point, I'll absolutely take it away and look at it. After all, we've brought in huge amounts of asymptomatic testing to care homes, uh, and we need to make sure that that's done um, that's done not just, as you say, for uh, the care home uh, staff and residents, um, but also takes into account visitors of all sorts, whether uh, personal visitors, uh, but also um, uh, those who are there, for instance, for inspection purposes. So I'll, I'll take away the detail of the point, uh, but in a way it underlines the importance of having a single institution with the core responsibility for the operational response to, to coronavirus. If you just be so kind to go over to the, sorry to put you through all of this, this. name an organisation, please. Thank you, Secretary of State. My name is Professor Maggie Ray. I'm the President of the UK Faculty of Public Health. So firstly, I'd like to thank you very much for acknowledging the tireless work that public health professionals in England and across the UK have been doing, not just to support this pandemic. And I was pleased that you recognised all the other work and all the infections that are going on that people probably don't know the detail of but are equally important. So thank you for that. Um, setting up a new agency, um, that sounds really exciting. And as a body, um, I can assure you we want to work alongside you because we do see ourselves as experts in standards for public health. Um, we're well renowned in that. But it didn't sound as if this was going to be more cuts to public health. It sounded like a much more dynamic, exciting investment. Could you, are you in a position to assure the public health community that that resonates in terms of um, making a difference, investing more money? You know, seeking ex excellence doesn't come cheap, does it? And then if you could also perhaps say something for our uh, young people in training at the moment, who clearly are going through quite a difficult time. You may have seen their letter in the press, and I'm sure it'd be very good to, for them to hear from you yeah. what your thoughts are in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maggie, Maggie, and thank you for your, um, for your leadership in this area. 
Um, the, um, uh, if I take the two parts of the question, um, the, I'll, I'll take the second first. Um, the, I think that there is an absolutely um, vital future for public health. I, I think it's, it's inevitable that it's higher on the agenda than it has been for decades, uh, frankly. Um, I think for all those going into public health, what I've tried to do today in terms of the national infrastructure and system that we have is provide clarity over the long-term direction, whilst also we will take the time to get it right institutionally, because I'm trying to pull off having the clarity over the long-term direction, getting, getting the driving the agenda forward, including with the vast sums of money that we've put into this area as government over the last six months, and of course that will continue. Um, and at the same time, um, of course, everybody's working incredibly hard at their day jobs. And so having the leadership pulled together now, uh, but having the institutional change happen over the next six months, uh, over the rest of this uh, financial year, um, will enable us to make the changes carefully but immediately get on with pulling the, uh, the new institution together. I do hope that this is an exciting moment. I hope that it's an exciting moment in health protection, um, and I have every confidence that the new um, uh, National Institute for Health Protection, because it builds on such excellence that we have in the system, uh, will be, uh, will be, uh, will be world-renowned. Um, but I'd also say something uh, to the... To health, improve, to health improvement experts, which is that you know, the, the government is on the front foot in a big way on health improvement, on the prevention agenda, and there is a huge responsibility to get that right. Um, and we must embed that, as I said in the speech, right across the board. Uh, in particular, the role of the NHS has to change to be more focused on prevention and less focused just on fixing things when they go wrong. And that will be a vital part of the future of uh, public health on the health improvement side. Um, so I think this is the right moment to, to um, I think this is the right long-term decision to have a health, uh, a, a National Institute for Health Protection, and then separately to ensure the health improvement uh, agenda is driven uh, forward instead of having the both in one organization. But I also, you mentioned the, um, uh, uh, some of the, press commentary. There's also a question of why now, uh, which I tried to answer in the speech, but I'll put it really directly. One of the lessons I've learned from the crisis is that, is that if something is the right thing to do, then putting off the change is usually the wrong thing to do. And I hope we've struck the balance between showing exactly where we're going um, immediately and then having the time to ensure that we build that institution properly. And, and that's, what, uh, we've, uh, that's what we've tried to do, and I'm very grateful for your support in the, in the journey so far, and, uh, and much more of what comes ahead. I have a couple more questions. Yes. Do, we have, do I see anyone else? Moment. Anyone? If I may, just for a moment, exercise chairman's privilege on uh, this to the start. You talked about non-hierarchical ways of working in the new uh, setup. Just wonder whether you could say a little bit more about that element of cultural change and what it might portend for other sections of the wider health service family. Well, uh, that's a very good question. Um, the, um, there are parts of the health system, this is true in parts of the NHS as well, um, where historically it's been very hierarchical, but new ways of working, especially because of the um, importance and prevalence of, uh, uh, of new technology allows for a much more, um, uh, much more porous borders, much more outward looking focus, um, uh, a reduction in uh, bureaucracy and, uh, and allow people to, uh, to, 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 to operate at the top of their license to reach their potential. And this is something that was a big focus of my speech a couple of weeks ago on the future of the NHS, but it's absolutely true in public health as well. Um, there's every, what, one of the things the crisis has shown is that everybody's got a huge contribution to make. And what we need the system to help them to make their best contribution uh, rather than hold things uh, back. And one of the critical things that means is also working um, 
uh, working m m with much more porous borders with the outside and uh, with the outside world. The relationship between uh, the national uh, health protection um, uh, activity and local authorities is critical. That's something PHE does very well, and we need to make sure that the new National Institute does that even better. Um, making sure that we work with the private sector, who've got a huge amount to bring to this, and we need to be open and outward looking in engagement between government, private sector, academia, the NHS, and by government, I mean government at all levels. And I, I just wanted to make that clear right from the start, that the culture of the new institution really matters. And the moment that you can set best set that uh, that uh, that working culture and ways of working uh, is right at the start. Let's see anyone, gentlemen there. If you just sorry, if you can come forward to the microphone and give your uh, name and organisation. I'm uh, Jonathan McShane, and I'm the chair of the Terence Higgins Trust. Um, I, I guess one of the benefits that people saw in Public Health England was having an organisation that was able to offer expert authoritative authoritative advice to government and had a degree of distance from government that so was able to challenge government and directors of public health obviously also value their ability to, when necessary, speak truth to power, as public health people might describe it. Do you, for, for both the health protection and the health improvement areas, do you see value in um, the, the new health protection organisation and whatever arrangements are made for health improvement, having that degree of distance that allows them to challenge government? So this is a, it's a really important question that we've thought about a lot, um, and it is a um, it's a challenging question, and it's actually a question that people have discussed around the pandemic response um, overall. And the um, uh, and and if I answer the general question, then the specific. The general question, my response is, um, I absolutely want to be provided with the best possible advice that is objective and given without fear or favour. Um, and as open to external challenge as possible. I think that the more we publish, the better, because you find out all sorts of things you didn't know from people who critique it from outside. This is true with open data and the drive to get more and more of the, for instance, the test and trace data published. Um, and, um, uh, and also uh, in terms of um, uh, scientific advice and public health um, advice. At the same time, you need operationally to be able to come together and work seamlessly together. And if you formalize independence too much, you can cause frictions in that part of the relationship which get in the way of response. And so um, the way that we're going to structure this with the new NIHP is that for clinical, for clinical analysis and clinical purposes, it reports to the CMO who is independent in terms of um, his advice and it is a he uh, but um, his advice to ministers and so i get i get very clear advice from uh, chris witty and he certainly doesn't aim off uh, according to my views he tells me exactly what the best possible clinical advice uh, is uh, and i'm sure the same is true in fact i know the same is true of my uh, of the health ministers in the devolved nations when something is a devolved responsibility and so hence the reporting line to the CMO for clinical, uh, essentially scientific purposes, will allow for that very uh, direct advice. Um, on the other hand, operationally, we need to make sure it's embedded with the, with the whole government effort. And on health improvement, the same applies. So we need to be able to have that distance for truth unto power uh, in terms of uh, uh, analytical and scientific advice. But at the same time, so many health improvement policies are actually policy, government policies. You know, air, tackling air pollution, I, I can't do it. I have to do it. You know, it's, a, it's me and DEFRA together. Um, and so actually that, that, if anything, needs to be more embedded in a classic departmental policy function because a lot of the time the job is to persuade other bits of Whitehall uh, to do the right thing. Is there anyone I can't see because they're obscured towards the back? Anyone who wants to ask a question? Any final question? Be generous with your time. Um, anyone going? Go. Please name an organisation, please. Hi, Emma Lynn from Pfizer. Um, you've referred a couple of times to the importance of the role of the private sector and the lessons that have been learned by the contributions from lots of different people through the pandemic. Um, I just wonder if you can expand a bit more on, you know, with this great long-term direction, 
what, how do we best respond to that and support yeah. that direction? Well, that's a, it's a great question. It's incredibly important. The truth is we couldn't have done this without the private sector. Uh, we couldn't have expanded uh, testing in the way that we did. Uh, we couldn't have expanded contact tracing in the way that we did. Um, we couldn't have come up with the treatments. Uh, you know, the one treatment that worked, that wasn't um, developed by a government. It was developed by a private company working within a government framework. Uh, that's the best work I've seen. It, it brings the contribution of, um, of, of the private sector, of government, and of uh, government institutions like, uh, like the NHS. Um, so I, I think that that's been one of the big learnings. This idea that there's a, that there's a divide is, is for the birds. And, and partnership is the best way uh, through. Um, so for a company uh, like Pfizer, well, you know, the truth is the single best thing you could do is make sure your vaccine works uh, and get it up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, and, um, uh, and, and there's a classic example, um, you know, the, uh, and on the, the vaccine that, um, the vaccine candidate, for instance, from, well, the Pfizer one is, a, is largely um, down to Pfizer, the um uh, themselves um the um you know the the, the vaccine uh, the oxford vaccine candidate a classic example of academia supported by government funds working with a business in astrazeneca to to get to scale and there is the that holy trinity of academia government and business working closely together on a public policy mission uh, so my message to everybody in the private sector is is join us in the mission Thank you. I think if there are no more questions, I just all that remains to say we're very delighted to play our part as an institution meant to contribute to public education on these matters. Many of those who've played a vital part in the debate through the years are here today. We look forward to welcoming you back, all of them back, and just please remain for me to ask you to join me in expressing appreciation to the Secretary of State. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you're meant to leave very quickly or very slowly, I'm afraid that this, but no doubt there's somebody expert enough in the audience who can tell us what's, uh, what has to be done. But uh, thank you, uh, the, uh, everyone can leave through the uh, back entrance. Thank you.